Hi, and welcome to the Institute of Politics. I'm Steve Edwards, the Executive Director of the Institute, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the Quadrangle Club for tonight's event. The Institute of Politics has a number of programs, all designed in part to help build a better democracy and inspire the next generation of public service leaders. Programs like this are an effort really to try and elevate the public conversation around current political issues, um, in some respects by looking at the past to help us understand what's going on, uh, not just then, but today. And I think that that's exactly what we'll help unpack and uncover today with our conversation with these two terrific guests. Um, I want to quickly point out before we officially introduce this, that this is in some respects, while it's a standalone event on its, uh, on its own merits, given the quality of Todd's book, many of you I'm sure caught the Fresh Air interview some months ago, uh, where he was with Terry Gross talking about his book. But um, it's also, in some respects, the first in a series of events that we're doing that are going to commemorate uh, the significant events of 1964. On April 21st, we're having a film screening at 7 p.m. at Hallowed Grounds on campus. It will show Freedom Song, looking at the Mississippi Freedom Summer Campaign. Also on May 5th, May 4th rather, Sunday, May 4th at 5 p.m. at Rockefeller Chapel, Danny Glover will be a featured keynote speaker for the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture and their annual lecture, also relaying on these themes and talking about political activism. We'll then have a series of workshops on campus related to this issue uh, and the history of Freedom Summer in, on May 12th and 13th. And finally, on Wednesday, May 14th, we will have our Joyce Democracy Forum looking at voting rights today with a terrific panel of guests uh, across the political spectrum looking at many of the current fights legally and politically moderated by the New Yorker's Jeffrey Tubin. So mark that on your calendar for Wednesday, May 14th. All of this, more details can be found on our website at politics.uchicago.edu. So I'll stop there and step aside to introduce Mara Hennigan, who is a second year here at the college, she's a public policy major, to introduce today's guest. Mara? Thank you, Steve. And thank you all for joining us for this evening, which promises to be a very compelling and exciting discussion. I'd like to first welcome our moderator, Professor Adam Green. Professor Green is an associate professor of American history here at the University of Chicago, where he also serves as master of the social, social sciences collegiate division deputy dean of social sciences and associate dean in the college he's an expert in modern u.s history african-american history and comparative racial politics a contributor to the new york times wttw wbez c-span and al jazeera adam is also the son of ernest green the eldest member of the historic little rock nine green is the author of the of the book Selling the Race, Culture and Community in Black Chicago from 1940 to 1955, and was co-editor with Charles Payne of Time Longer Than Rope, Studies in African-American Activism from 1850 to 1950. Professor Green earned his PhD from Yale University. We are also incredibly lucky to welcome award-winning journalist Todd S. Purdom this evening. Mr. Purdom started his journalism career as a copy boy in 1982 for the New York Times, where he proceeded to spend the next 23 years of his career. From 1997 until 2001, Mr. Purdom served as the New York Times Los Angeles Bureau Chief. While with the New York Times, he also held the positions of Metropolitan Reporter and City Hall Bureau Chief in New York. Most recently, Mr. Purdom was a correspondent in the Washington Bureau, where he also served as a diplomatic and White House correspondent. Mr. Purdom joined Vanity Fair as national editor in 2006. Tonight, Mr. Purdom will share his thoughts and findings from his new book, Titled, published this month, titled An Idea Whose Time Has Come, Two Presidents, Two Parties, and the Battle for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Timed perfectly with the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, Mr. Bur Mr. Purdom's book explores the politics and key players surrounding the passage of this monumentous legislation. Please join me in welcoming them both. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And it is wonderful to welcome you here, Todd, to talk with us about this latest work that you've done. We were having a conversation before we came in, which I thought might be a good way to start, about, in one sense, this book is a book in about a year, a year plus in the life of the nation, but what a year in relation to everything that's going on, all of the different characters that are working in relation to each other the weightiness of the issues. And 
You spoke, I thought, really eloquently about the challenges of having to find ways to pull together different details, different events, different individuals into a narrative that gives us a sense about how to bring us back into that moment in time and appreciate the process that yielded this extraordinary piece of legislation. And I wanted to ask you maybe just to start to speak a little bit about the ways in which you approached getting your head around these events and around this story. Well, thank you, Adam, and it's certainly my pleasure to be here. One of the challenges I set for myself was to try to recreate insofar as I could the world of 1963 and 1964, and though I was alive at that time, I wasn't particularly aware of that world, so I was learning a lot of this for the first time. And one of the things I realized in my initial research when I basically just tried to make a, an essential timeline of what had happened when was how crowded those years were and how cheek by jowl events were tumbling one after the other. In the Kennedy administration, he was dealing with so many things, foreign crises, but in, on civil rights alone, he had to contend with the Freedom Riders, the, the, the lunch counter sit-ins and then the Freedom Riders, <clears throat> and then the integration of Ole Miss and the riots, the awful spring in Birmingham with the dogs and police hoses and uh, fire hoses and so forth. President Johnson, same thing. At the very moment he was signing the bill, Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner had gone missing and were presumed dead in, in Mississippi. So for me, the challenge was to do two things. Use newspapers and published accounts from other narratives to try to create the basic timeline. Then go around to all these archives, the presidential libraries, the congressional archives, flesh out the detail. I had the help of a wonderful research assistant who uh, read the congressional record during the, the debate over the bill. And then I had to sit down and try to sort of piece these things all together. And the first draft was definitely the hardest part because you're not really aware where things fit in the story and where to bring in the characters and who belongs where. And so as I went through the second and third drafts, it was a much more um, satisfying process. It was like working a jigsaw puzzle. You could see what would make sense. And I really did set as my goal to try to <clears throat> make people remember as if I were trying to explain it to my own children who are 10 and 14 and have really no sense of what, what we're talking about here how within our lifetimes, a hundred years after the Civil War, the Civil War's basic business remains so completely unfinished in much of the country. Mm -hmm. And in fact, President Kennedy did not know how to celebrate things like the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. He was very embarrassed because his record at that point on civil rights was so uh, skimpy that um, he kind of ducked the question altogether. And the fear was that we were really on the verge of, of something like a second Civil War. So that was another educational aspect for me to realize just we think of our own time as uniquely divided. The country was terribly divided 50 years ago and yet produced this result. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, in your title that you refer to is not just the legislative process, but in fact that this is a history of two presidents. And it seems in many ways that the way in which those two presidents, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Baines Johnson, not only worked upon their times, but found themselves to some degree transformed by the people they encountered, by the responsibilities they had in terms of trying to give leadership, and coming to terms with what they didn't know, as well as what they did know in terms of being in that position of ultimate responsibility as a president. Could you say a little bit more about the ways in which those two individuals found themselves changing as they tried to become leaders in the process of creating civil rights legislation? Well, in John Kennedy's case, as he once somewhat abashedly confessed, he grew up in a, a household of great privilege, one of the great fortunes of the world. He once said he didn't really know anything about the Great Depression until he studied it at Harvard. His own acquaintance with black people was largely limited to the two successive valets who served him from his days as an undergraduate until the last morning of his life. When he was running for president in 1960, a black dentist in San Francisco asked him how many black professionals he knew, and he said he didn't know five people of the dentist caliber that he could call by their mm. first name, but he was going to try to work harder. So his education was really quite remarkable, and he came slowly to the cause. He saw it. He, he never... Uh, was against civil rights as a moral issue. He always saw that it was important to resolve this question. But early in his presidency, he was deeply reluctant to make it too big a priority because he felt it could jeopardize the whole of the rest of his agenda, which was dependent for support of the southern barons who controlled particularly the Senate, but also the House. And he didn't want to put at risk things like his big tax cut, the economic stimulus program, uh, in the name of civil rights. But eventually, events and his own growing outrage at the basic unfairness of it did force his hand. Mm 
And so when he finally proposed the comprehensive bill in June of 63, he made a speech that night in the White House. He decided to do it on about two hours' notice. He went in front of the cameras, and the speech wasn't even finished. Mm -hmm. He ad-libbed the last two and a half minutes of the speech. And you can tell, because he's ad-libbing, how much it's coming from the heart. And that night he, he said that this is primarily a moral issue, as old as the scriptures and as clear as the Constitution. And he elevated in a stroke this long-running debate into the highest moral imperative for the country to live up to its creed. And that was really remarkable. And you know, I think in some ways he's not remembered enough for that speech. People remember that President Kennedy was a reluctant convert to the cause of civil rights. But when he jumped in, he jumped in with both feet and with his famous sort of Kennedy competitiveness. He was determined to see it through. Obviously, he was assassinated as the bill was making its way through the House. President Johnson, by contrast, had known uh, privation of his own. He'd known poor people. He'd been poor. He taught famously in a Mexican school in Texas where he said you could never forget what hate could do to the eyes of a child. Uh, he too had black servants. His experience with them was in some ways more transformative. He, he had a, a sort of butler valet named Gene Williams whose job it was to drive his car back to Texas at the end of every Senate session. And one year, Johnson asked him to drive the family Beagle, little Beagle Johnson, like everyone else, LBJ. And Mr. Williams, who's one of his other jobs was to break in the president's new shoes when they, they had exactly the same shoe size. So Johnson wanted him to wear the shoes till they got soft. But he asked him to take the dog. And uh, Gene Williams said, oh, Senator, please don't make me do that. He said, why not? He said, it's hard enough for me to drive across the South as a black man. I can't find a place to stop or get gas or eat or go to the bathroom. Don't make me take a dog, mm -hmm. too. And so I think, although Johnson was most famous by, by the time he became president for having watered down the 57 and 60 civil rights bills, and the civil rights community was very skeptical of him, he had quietly become quite a passionate advocate for it. And in the spring of 1963, he was pushing the president to go farther and faster than even the president wanted and had made some public comments that went well beyond anything the president said. So it's an interesting interesting journey for both of them, and they were both transformed by their experiences uh, to come to this cause. Both of them, as you said before, were identified in a certain sense either with a kind of northern patrician indifference to thinking about race as an issue that had in, related to disparities, related to significant kinds of inequalities in, in, in the United States, and then in Johnson's case, someone as a southerner who had at one, as he put it, a kind of uh, relationship of never having been a beneficiary of the Southern racial system, but at the same time, someone who felt like he was beholden to uphold it to some degree when he was in Congress. And I'm struck that when you mentioned the June 11th speech that Kennedy gave, there were two very poignant moments, of course, that came up that evening. One was that Martin Luther King called him, I think, an hour after the speech in order to give him a sense of how much he appreciated it. And that was important in terms of emboldening the, race, the, the leadership of the civil rights movement to think about the March on Washington and other projects. But three hours later in Mississippi, Medgar Evers was shot and killed by an assassin, presumably because of the outrage that that individual felt at thinking about things beginning, the tide beginning to turn against them. The ways in which people on the ground engaged in civil rights campaigns, civil rights movements, activists, leaders, the ways in which they're impacting the thinking of these two individuals. I, want, I do want to get to Congress, but I just don't want to turn away from how these individuals, these two presidents, were transformed in part because of who they encountered, African Americans who were different from the dentist that John F. Kennedy came into contact with, but people of moral stature, people of moral urgency that perhaps really pushed them to have to rethink the ways in which they were approaching these issues. What were the ways in which they were thinking specifically about the civil rights movement as well as the issue of civil rights? Well, yeah, time? I should have said earlier that, that the paradox is that Kennedy's acquaintance was limited on the one hand to his servants and to the leaders of the movement itself, yeah. to Dr. King, uh, Roy Wilkins of the NAACP, Whitney Young of the Urban League, uh, James Farmer, of course, so on. And so he was discomfited by these men, but he couldn't doubt their moral authority. And we have to remember, too, that the civil rights movement itself was not monolithic. There were a number of divisions, just as there are today in the gay rights movement, for example, about whether you should have pushed uh, the right to marry or some other issue uh, at the Supreme Court. And Roy Wilkins and the NAACP, with Thurgood Marshall running the legal strategy, had believed that the key was patient litigation, 
successful strategic campaigns culminating with Brown versus Board of Education to you know, get desegregation uh, enshrined in court decisions and law. Dr. King believed that the thing to do was to move hearts and minds and, and create a mass movement of political pressure from the outside. And there's a famous exchange circa 1963 when Roy Wilkins of the NAACP asked Dr. King, I'd like to know what you've ever desegregated, Martin. Mm. He says, I guess I've just desegregated a few human hearts. And the truth is, one of the hearts he had moved that spring was John Kennedy's with those mm -hmm. demonstrations in Birmingham. And the president felt that this was giving the country an enormous strategic and also moral black eye in the Cold War. How could we preach democracy abroad if we were not living up to it at home? And Johnson, Johnson felt a similar thing. Johnson knew uh, more than Kennedy did what these leaders of the movement had been through. He, he understood the kind of prejudice they'd faced. He'd seen prejudice in his own region. And, uh, and he was definitely, he made it his business in the immediate aftermath of the assassination to reach out to them. For example, Martin Luther King was not invited to Kennedy's funeral, but he came anyway. And Johnson happened to catch sight of him saying some very supportive things in a television interview and went out of his way to call him and tell him how much he'd be needing him in the, in the coming days mm -hmm. and months. Mm -hmm. Now let's turn over to Congress because although the presidents are important in this story, I think one of the things that's really striking is the way in which you're able to reconstruct the process of legislation and lawmaking from the point of Congress. If you could think about Congress, say around the time of the summer of 1963 in ways that really carry through to Johnson's presidency after Kennedy's assassination and the eventual passage of the act, how would you map out the blocks that existed within Congress? What were the lines that divided people in relation to party, in relation to region, in relation to ideology? And what would you say were the particular sorts of talents of statecraft that people needed in order to arrange those blocks into effective constituencies or effective majorities to be able to pass legislation? Well, the reality of our politics was so completely different then. There were two parties in name, but in fact, when it came to race or civil rights, there were three parties. And something I had not known is that Congressional Quarterly, the, the sort of leading blow-by-blow -blow journal of Congress in those days, tracked votes, not just with R's and D's for Republicans and Democrats, but R's and DN and DS for Northern and Southern, because it was really the th a three-party system. And the Democrats were so divided on this question that the only way to make progress on civil rights was to strike alliances between the Northern Liberal Democrats and the sometimes even conservative Republicans who felt that their heritage as the party of Lincoln was very important to them. They took that very seriously. And so not only was it necessary to have cross-party alliances, it was possible. And it was, uh, it was practical. And, and so the challenge for first President Kennedy and President Johnson was to thread their way through that divide, knowing that although they had overwhelming majorities of their own party in both houses, they couldn't, it was an illusion because they couldn't uh, pass the bill because they didn't have the support of the Southerners. So for example, in the Senate, there weren't even 50 Democrats uh, solidly behind civil rights, much less the 67 that would then be needed to cut off debate. Now we, we moan and groan because you can't uh, end a filibuster in the Senate unless you have 60 votes. Then you had to have 67, a real two-thirds. And so that was... Which they were ultimately able to which get. Which they were ultimately able to get. But that drove every consideration of first President Kennedy and President Johnson was how they would make that alliance work. And um, there were a couple of key players, first in the House and then in the Senate. In the Senate, Everett Dirksen of Illinois was the crucial linchpin, the m minority leader who was from Pekin. And uh, he is the one who was absolutely essential in bringing the, the rest of his caucus along. And at the end of the day, the bill passed the Senate 73 to 27 with 27 out of 33 Republican votes. So mm -hmm. in proportional terms, the Republicans were much more committed to this cause than the Democrats. And if I could ask you to talk a little bit more maybe about two Republicans in particular, because it strikes me that there are also distinctions to draw between the ways in which particular Republican elected officials responded to the cause of civil rights, to the opportunity to find themselves in a position of actually moving that forward. Of course, Edward, Everett Dixon, Dixon, you mentioned before from Illinois, but also Bill McCullough from Ohio, who you speak about as being very, very instrumental. Indeed, I think by the end of the book, you mention him as being the person whose influence perhaps was greatest in terms of ultimately being able to move the act forward. Tell us a little bit about these He's events. a person I had never heard of at all. He was a congressman from West Central Ohio. His hometown of Piqua is now represented by Speaker John Boehner. Mm 
And McCulloch was just about as conservative as Boehner. He opposed federal aid to education, gun control, foreign aid, but he was descended from abolitionists before the Civil War, and as a young lawyer fresh out of Ohio State, he'd gone down to practice law in Jacksonville, Florida, and had seen the indignities of Jim Crow. So he was the ranking Republican on the House Judiciary Committee, and thus the expert on, on this issue and this bill, which was coming before that committee. And, and when President Kennedy first proposed the bill in the summer of 63, McCulloch made a deal with the administration. He said that if they promised not to water down the bill in the Senate, which had been the usual practice and the only way to get a bill passed, and, unbelievably enough, if they would promise to give the Republicans equal political credit heading into the 1964 presidential election, he would bring along the Republican caucus in the House and in his committee for this bill. And that's exactly what he did. But his strategy had the effect of forcing the administration to try to break the filibuster, to cut off debate in the Senate, rather than trade away and weaken the bill. And this one person, who's almost completely forgotten today, really affected, more than any other person, the whole course of the strategy and the debate that played out over the next 12 months. And uh, when he was getting ready to retire from Congress in 1971, there's one person who knew how important he'd been. And aboard the yacht Christina in the Mediterranean, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis wrote him this incredibly emotional three-page letter saying that she knew more than anyone, probably, he was responsible for this. And in the last weeks of President Kennedy's life, it had given enormous comfort to know that he had McCulloch's backing. Senator Dirksen was a little bit different because he was more practical. He, he knew that the bill, the, the, the title comes from something he said on the floor of the Senate, paraphrasing Victor Hugo, who said, stronger than all the armies is an idea whose time had come. Mm -hmm. So Dirksen knew that there was a demand for this bill, that something had to be done 100 years after the Civil War. He also took seriously his own heritage as a, as a guy from Illinois. And when the president proposed the bill, he said he was all for it except two points in the, the heart of the bill. Section two, which was desegregation of hotels and public accommodations, mm -hmm. the really emotional, symbolic heart of the bill, and the employment discrimination section. And Dirksen, because Illinois, even then, 50 years ago, had strong anti-discrimination laws, he was concerned, as he saw it, that this bill could uh, impose uh, federal record-keeping requirements that would harass the small businessman. So he wanted to give states like his own, that had strong laws already on the books, first crack before the feds got involved. And this had the effect of making the bill focus overwhelmingly on the legal segregation in the South and leaving untouched to this day the de facto segregation that prevails in Chicago and Washington mm -hmm. and Boston and Los Angeles. And the Southerners saw this for exactly what it was, an effort to round up votes from the Midwesterners for cloture. And it worked. But it, it, it meant that the bill had some compromises in it that would not really address uh, segregation outside the South. Now, before we talk about the process that ensued in Congress, including the opposition to actually moving the bill forward, particularly in the Senate, we should probably talk a little bit about the bill itself in terms of thinking about the ways in which it began as one set of proposals coming in part from uh, the Kennedy administration picked up by Bill McCullough and then becoming something rather different, although retaining many of those same elements by the time it was actually passed as an act. There were seven titles, for instance, that existed within the original uh, House Resolution 7152, one related to voting protections, bans on discrimination, public accommodations, bans on discrimination in public facilities, enhanced federal involvement in the desegregation of the schools, strengthening of the Civil Rights Commission, bans on discrimination within government agencies, and bans on discrimination in employment. And yet, by the end, there were 11 different titles. One, very interestingly, that reflected in some ways the maneuvering of the opposition to the bill that related to uh, and trying to find ways to provide for jury trials in relation to those that were seen in contempt of court in relation to offenses around some of these acts. And the other, most famously, that had to do with introducing sex as a category of discrimination in relation to employment as well as race, religion, and other categories. How should we think about, in terms of understanding the legislation in terms of its components, the ways in which it went from something significant but you know, somewhat constrained to something that was even more expansive, oddly, by the time that it was finished? Well, it's a really fascinating point, Adam, and, and when we talked about it a little bit before we came out here, but we think of these processes when they take a long time and uh, there's a lot of debate and it's very contentious. We think the risk is that uh, 
legislation might get watered down or weakened or frittered away. And in fact, the remarkable story of this bill is that in most important ways at every step, it really did get stronger. And that's partly because both sides were able to have their say, they were able to test out their ideas, they were able to see what would fly, and they were able to bring people along. And then there were also all sorts of unintended consequences in a sense, because you mentioned in the initial Kennedy bill, there was only a very weak provision for employment discrimination. It basically covered government contractors, and it didn't have much binding teeth in it. As the bill's working its way through the House, uh, the administration is looking for ways to build support from the civil rights groups who, for whom employment discrimination was a really important issue. And one of the things they did was go back to an old Republican bill, an old Republican proposal to have a, a strong federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, but make its judgments subject to appeals in the courts. Mm -hmm. So that instead of having an administrative agency that by fiat could dictate the outcome, it would let people have their day in court. And this was seen as a sort of very appealing idea to Republicans because it was classic, uh, you know, fight it out. And so they put that part in the bill, and it stayed and it stuck there. And it, it had the effect of making a very strong provision where there had been no provision before. And then there was a point at which the, the chairman of the House Rules Committee, a, a, a former judge from Virginia named Howard Smith, who hated civil rights, was determined to block this bill. He couldn't do that. When it finally got to the floor of the House, he inserted what most people thought was a poison pill by, as you say, adding the word sex to the categories that would be covered under employment discrimination. And pandemonium ensued because the civil rights supporters felt this would risk the bill, you know, put the bill at risk of failing, first in the House, then in the Senate. And finally, the handful of women who were then in Congress stood up on that Saturday morning and said, don't be crazy. This is a crumb for us. It's the least we can expect. Don't you think we deserve this? So it passed, and I was at a book event in Washington a couple weeks ago, and a, a man who'd been a young lawyer at the EEOC when it got started recalled that the initial flood of complaints to that agency was, in fact, from women. And there were big debates about what, how to deal with this because the budget was thought to be, you know, the, the heart of the bill was meant to be racial discrimination, but the people who were actually filing the complaints were women. And as we see over the past 50 years, that completely revolutionized the status of women in the workplace. And they've been tremendous beneficiaries of this measure that a racist segregationist from Virginia inserted <laughs> as an effort to doom the bill. Mm -hmm. So that the audience today, given the ways in which we're habituated to a politics that has heated opposition, are comfortable thinking about this story. Tell us a little bit about how the opposition functioned, both in the House and especially in the Senate, in relation to what they tried to do to stop the legislation from going forward, what were the ways in which they were wielding their own knowledge of statecraft and protocol in relation particularly to operations within the Senate so that we understand the political process in a sense from both sides? Well, in the House, they tried to lo load it up with amendments that would have weakened it, that would have cut the heart out of the bill, that would have limited enforcement powers. And remember, the, if the civil rights community and the northern liberals who were for this bill saw it as uh, resolving the unfinished business of the Civil War, the Southerners saw it as the ultimate humiliation that they were facing, worse than Reconstruction itself, upending their entire way of life as they saw it and settled folkways that had lasted for generations. And they were determined to fight this, and they were fighting it all the harder because they knew, they really knew when the thing began, they couldn't win. So their hope was to delay it or weaken it or hold it off. And they came up with a lot of ludicrous proposals. Richard Russell of Georgia, who was the leader of the Southern opposition, he proposed an um, amendment at one point that would have, or probably I guess it was a separate bill, that would have provided federal subsidies for the relocation of black Americans throughout the states so the population in all states would be roughly the same. Mm -hmm. A way of saying to people, you know, in Iowa or Indiana, how would you feel if you had as many black people living around you as I do in Georgia? And it went nowhere, but it was intended as symbolic. But, but you, do, you do take a sharp breath when you read some of the things that were said on the floor of the Senate 50 years ago in broad daylight. And some of the arguments were sort of constitutional and economic, very much like what we heard about the Affordable Care Act. This is a federal power grab. It will impose communism. It will impose a state police force. We will have you know, Gestapo tactics. And some of it was just unbelievable. There was a long colloquy one day between Strom Thurmond, then a Democrat from South Carolina, and Russell Long of Louisiana about whether it was inhumane to use cattle prods on demonstrators. Mm 
And Senator Long said they weren't intended for people at all, but they were intended for animals of just the sort that were getting in the way of the police. And then Senator Thurmond said that he'd been chased by one once during a fraternity hazing ritual, and it mostly just tickled, and it would be okay to use, yeah. use them. So when you see things like that, you think, well, whoa, you know. Yeah, a bit like Newt Gingrich responding to Abu Ghraib. Yeah. Um, another element that's interesting, though, in the story of the passage was the way in which this other category of legislator, these Midwestern Republicans, conservative to some degree, certainly fiscally, um, not necessarily socially progressive, but decent in terms of the ways in which they saw um, this notion of fair play, this notion of being able to move towards equality, how they found themselves having to respond to lobbies from outside. In some cases, of course, usual suspects, civil rights leaders, uh, lobbyists like Clarence Mitchell and others, but also surprisingly a number of church groups. Yep. And I was really fascinated, for example, by the way in which different functionaries within the Johnson administration took it upon themselves to learn the exact denomination of each and every key member within the Republican uh, group in order to be able to ensure that they were hearing from their constituencies within these church groups. Say a little bit about no, that. No, it was a please. pinpoint precision effort, and it's something that's not so well remembered, and certainly I didn't understand it until I began my research. But led by the National Council of Churches and a whole raft of religious groups, interfaith groups, um, in tandem with, but not the same as, Dr. King and the, the mainstream civil rights groups who were doing their demonstrations. These people undertook a letter writing campaign, an education campaign, an in-person lobbying campaign, prayer vigils round the clock at the Lincoln Memorial, and they concentrated their efforts very strategically on the Midwest and Great Plains states where people, where members did not have large black constituencies, but had lots of Methodists and Presbyterians and Baptists and Jews and they would arrange for someone to be lobbied by his own clergyman or his own archbishop. Carl Munt, a very conservative, very conservative Republican from South Dakota, was heard to exclaim in the cloakroom one day when he took a sympathetic vote in favor of the bill, I hope that satisfies those two goddamn bishops who called me last night. <laughs> and he was under such heat from people felt that if in their communities this was being elevated to a moral issue in their pulpits on s Sunday mornings, they couldn't fight it. And Senator Russell of Georgia said, you know, we could fight the lawyers, we can't fight the preachers. And it had an enormous effect. It's fascinating, though, that they felt accountable to religious constituencies in that way at that time, which perhaps is something that uh, is striking in terms of thinking potentially about contrast today, or perhaps not in the sense that we think about uh, religious leadership in relation to those of people that appear on television, those people that take part in large kinds of confabs to identify key candidates, those individuals who present themselves as the guardians of a kind of conservative set of moral standards. But there are plenty of other people who organize yeah. themselves within churches and write letters and, and do other sorts of things. So it's striking that that was so effective and that politicians felt so accountable to that. Well, I think in one way, you know, politicians of that era themselves were much more likely to be churchgoers. Almost mm -hmm. everybody had some affiliation or denomination. Um, and it's just uh, interesting how sort of lethally effective it was, this quiet, patient effort uh, to, to, to appeal to, to prick their conscience. Because the truth is, a lot of these people had no, um, th there was no political reason. They wouldn't be at any risk politically if they opposed civil rights. And they wouldn't get much reward politically if they supported it. Uh, but somehow this effort had the uh, effect of making people look themselves in the mirror and say, you know, I don't want to have to, hmm. I don't want to have to face him and explain to him why I'm against this. And there also, by this point, came the feeling that the train was really leaving the station on this, and you had a choice. You were standing at a crossroads of history, and you could be on the right side or the wrong side. And it's poignant to see some of the Southerners who clearly had, who knew what was happening, and they didn't want to prolong it, but they, they weren't brave enough either to really make the break. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, another aspect of what I guess could be called a ground game in relation to this process was just simply ensuring that people were able to count votes accurately know where people stood. And in a way that I found you know, very fascinating, I'm sure as a, a sort of veteran reporter in relation to Congress, this is old hat for you, but making sure that members of Congress were actually available to vote when votes were taking place. And so I, I forget the name of the young staffer 
who put together a set of intrepid people to run around Congress and ensure that the staff of a particular senator or a particular congressman knew that person has to be down on the floor in five minutes in order to be able to cast a vote. Can you the, talk a little the, bit well, about that? Well, the special part? challenge was in the House where the bill could be vulnerable to hostile amendments from the floor. Mm -hmm. And in those days, um, as now, the only people who can take notes in the gallery are the, the reporters. Lobbyists and advocacy groups have to sit there and can't take votes. And because the House was meeting in what's called the Committee of the Whole, the votes were not recorded by name. They passed through a, a teller and were tapped on the shoulder, yay or nay. So if you wanted to keep track of who was voting how, you had to sit in the gallery, know the faces of all 435 members, memorize what they had done, keep mm -hmm. a running tally in your head, and then rush out in the hallway and write down what you saw. Mm -hmm. And they also had to run around in the pre-beeper, pre-cell phone age, age, they had to run around physically to the offices in the office buildings and round up the friendly members mm -hmm. to make sure there'd be enough to hold off any hostile uh, votes. And there was this young woman from the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers. She'd just come from graduate school at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Jane O'Grady, she's still alive and living in Washington. Mm -hmm. And it was her job, and she created this group of kids, and they were called O'Grady's Raiders. And they would run around, and after about the third day, the members were so exhausted by this, they said, don't, you know, I'll come, don't come anymore. <laughs> and when the bill finally passed the House, she felt so bad about having uh, pestered them so much, she stayed up all night with a friend baking um, vanilla sugar cookies frosted with chocolate equal signs and taking them around to all the mem members who'd helped. Um, and it seems, it seems like such a low-tech, um, almost kind of Girl Scout thing to do, but it worked. Sure, sure. Well, baking the cookies, but also being able to actually know oh, totally. all of the members and keeping track of that. We're used to attributing that knowledge of Congress to someone like Lyndon Baines Johnson. But I was struck by how many people had that kind of razor-sharp knowledge of the process and applied it to ensure that everybody was in their proper place in relation to moving this legislation forward. So... When, when things come to the end of the, of, of the period of, of, into the summer of 1964, and uh, it's become clear that closure has been called, uh, there's a little bit more uh, attempts to obstruct and slow down the process by trying to introduce amendments. But as you said, basically people have a sense on the other side that the game is up. Say a little bit about what people felt that they had accomplished as a result of being able to you know, wait this game out, be able to outlast people, people like Robert Byrd, who filibustered yeah. for All almost a long. day straight, yeah. um, others who had been able to serially ensure that Mike Mansfield was not even able to introduce the legislation for several days because of the discussion preliminary to actually being able to call the, the bill to the floor. Did people feel like they simply had won a victory? Did people feel like they had actually, in the parlance of the civil rights movement, converted and brought them around to their side? Did they think that this was something that was going to usher in a brave new world, or did they feel like this was really just the start of the work? In well, terms I of think the country? part of what happened, you, you make a very interesting point about how long it had gone on, and it really went on for almost three months. And so what the pro-civil rights forces led in the Senate by Mike Mansfield, the majority leader, and Hubert Humphrey, who was the floor manager, the field general for the bill, they felt if they let the Southerners have their say and simply rebutted their arguments at every turn, but were totally gentlemen, totally polite, didn't try to ram anything down anybody's throat, that eventually, in an almost jujitsu way, that the dynamic and the energy would change. And it would suddenly be the Southerners who were on the defensive for having stopped the business of the nation hmm. on this question. And an enormous force would come bearing down on them to give up the ghost. And at the end of the day, that's what happened. And you mentioned Clarence Mitchell, who was the longtime chief lobbyist for the NAACP, another unsung hero, African-American, uh, uh, who was known as the 101st senator at a time when there were only five black members out of 535 in Congress. Mm -hmm. And he, he was patrolling the halls all the time. So on the day that cloture was finally voted, in what can only be described as an extraordinary act of graciousness, he walked Richard Russell, the losing senator, back to his office. And Russell said, you know, because they let us talk so much and they let us have our say, uh, we'll be able to go home and tell our constituents that we lost fair and square and this bill will be enforceable and it'll be accepted because this happened. On the other side, the pro-civil rights forces, they were exhausted. They knew it wasn't perfect. They knew it was kind of a first step and they knew they'd have to keep at it. And indeed, a year later, they had to come back, the same cast of characters largely, with the Voting Rights Act because the voting protection provisions in this bill were too weak. They didn't apply to state and local elections. 
But the thing that's striking is I've interviewed a number of the surviving aides to, to Humphrey, Mansfield, Senator Dirksen too, and really to a person, and most of them are in their 80s now and some in their 90s, when they would talk about this moment and talk about the passage of the bill, uh, they would have a hard time controlling their emotions and they all still feel, and they were young men when they did it, that it's the most important, meaningful thing they ever did in their lives. And they knew how momentous it was and people had gathered on the steps of the Capitol after the final vote waiting for Hubert Humphrey to come out. 300 and some people. Not any organized group, just people had flocked to the Capitol. They'd heard on the radio or television that the bill, and, uh, and it was apparently just an overwhelming feeling of, wow, we really did something. As John Dingle, the retiring dean of the house, told me, he said, we felt we'd earned our, we'd earned our keep. Mm. We'd done what we were supposed to do. Mm. One of the things that you, of course, did as a journalist was to spend a great deal of time covering uh, both houses of Congress through the 90s into 2000 um, and then moved on to other branches of government. Um, I, I do want to ask a question about the ways in which you see how the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is remembered today in relation to the different commemorations that have taken place. But I really want to also ask you a question based on that prior experience, thinking about politics before this period that we think of as so broken, so dysfunctional, so incapable of being able to generate legislation. What are the ways in which the achievements of this passage of this act were remembered in those earlier times, in the time when you were covering the Northeast Regional Delegation and saw people like Senator D'Amato, Senator Bradley, and others, when other sorts of significant pieces of legislation were coming forward, but perhaps ones that didn't involve quite the same lift? Or does every era find itself having to figure out how to use the tools of legislation in order to come up with the best possible kind of intervention in relation to social affairs that it can at its time. Well, I suppose every generation does find itself having to find its own path, but by the time I came to covering Congress and the Senate in the mid-90s, uh, you know, C-SPAN was very much in force. People would uh, have charts and graphs for the camera. It became almost essential to have a chart. Uh, members of Congress don't really know each other very much anymore. They don't spend more than three days in Washington. Most of them, they go home to their districts or sleep on their couches. Their families don't know each other. Their kids don't play sports with each other. Um, Fifty years ago, they really did know each other. They spent a lot of time with each other across party lines. They worked on interests of mutual concern uh, when they could. Um, and uh, they, they weren't posturing for the C-SPAN cameras. They weren't listening to their pollsters say how they should raise money on this with a flyer. Uh, they weren't getting their talking points in line for the nightly news. Uh, and the most crucial negotiations on the bill in the Senate took place fundamentally in private because the, the Judiciary Committee was chaired by James Eastland of Mississippi, a vicious racist who wouldn't do anything about the bill. So Senator Dirksen and Senator Mansfield and Humphrey had to create a kind of informal ad hoc committee that would hammer out the bill. And these sessions all took place in the back room of Dirksen's office, which he called the Twilight Lodge. It was equipped with a full bar. It had a clock on the wall and every numeral on the clock was five. So it was always time for a drink, whatever time of day it really was. <laughs> and uh, Nick Katzenbach, the Deputy Attorney General, told me shortly before he died that the challenge of these evening negotiations with Dirksen was to get agreement before so much bourbon had been consumed that he wouldn't remember the next morning uh, what he'd agreed to the night before. Because if he wanted changes in language, it, you could do it one time without changing the meaning. But if you had to do it twice, it would change the meaning. Mm. And so it, I don't mean to sound flippant to say that maybe they should drink more today. But they, they certainly respected each other as human beings. And this, the book is full of examples of people having a very bitter dispute on the floor and then sharing a gesture of fellowship afterwards and praising each other as human beings. And I think that's something that's completely inconceivable in today's Washington. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that is really, when Newt Gingrich became the speaker in 1995, he urged the freshmen, uh, don't come to Washington. Don't get Potomac fever. Stay at home in your district. Uh, don't get part of the capital culture. And there, there are things wrong with the cozy culture, you know, too. It covered up a lot of bad behavior, including up drunkenness. But, um, but I, I have to imagine that it, it, it's better to have been in somebody's house the night before because you can't call them a dirty name the next day. I mean, I think that 
probably did have a good effect. Mm -hmm. So I, I've gotten the signal for us to switch over to questions from the audience. I just want to ask one final question, which I think can, in a sense, kick off uh, perhaps some thoughts from the audience as well. You went down recently to the commemoration that took place at the LBJ Library down in Austin of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and you heard the president's speech, actually four president's speeches, I guess, if I remember correctly and many other people speaking about this. When you look now at the ways in which we are remembering this act, the ways in which we're recognizing the process of creating it, as well as its outcome and its legacy, what do you think we're doing a good job of remembering about this time and this accomplishment? And what do you think that we need to do a better job of understanding as important coming out of this into our own time? Well, I think President Johnson, you know, justifiably deserves a lot of credit, an enormous amount of credit for this bill. And last week he certainly got it. And the library had set as its pretty explicit goal uh, bringing back into some sort of balance President Johnson's reputation, which had been so colored by the disaster of Vietnam, to say that on the domestic front he really had unparalleled accomplishments. But what I thought was interesting about Johnson's actual role in lobbying and working on the bill was that for a person who was a famous wheeler dealer, the most important thing he did was not wheel or deal. He said, we're not going to, following Bill McCulloch's mm -hmm. demand, we're not going to weaken this bill, we're not going to trade it away, and we're gonna just wait here till we get the bill we have, if it takes all day, it takes all year. And he also knew that he could not involve himself too closely in the micromanagement of making the law because this, his former colleagues would very much resent him. He wasn't a senator anymore, he was the president. So I think it's, it's, it's just as admirable for a person of such enormous will and uh, drive that he held himself back, he held himself in check. And I think that's a little bit under-remembered. We think of Lyndon Johnson as this sprawling egomaniac who couldn't stop himself from, but I, in this case he was very strategic and he was very disciplined and I think that that's, needs to be remembered. I also think, as I said earlier, that we tend to give President Kennedy short shrift. Um, he was slow to the cause, he, he was, his position did evolve, but once he got in the thick of it, he was really in the thick of it, and he had staked his entire prestige behind it, and I think he wouldn't have given up. So I think one of the questions people ask me all the time is would the bill have passed if he had lived, and I think the answer, my answer is yes, it would have eventually, maybe it would have been weakened, but I think it would have passed. And then finally, the, the thing we forget and need to remember is the bill didn't happen magically by one you know, great figure like Lyndon Johnson. It happened because of the work of thousands and thousands of people, some of whom died in, in the streets. But then people like Jane O'Grady, people like Clarence Mitchell, it's like you know, when your children play soccer and they're just starting, everyone chases the ball. And what happened in this bill is everyone played his position and they did just what they were supposed to do in their own niche and they weren't worried about who was getting the credit. Hubert Humphrey, he was probably the single most important person on the Democratic side in the Senate in crafting the strategy. And when the bill passed, whose picture was on the cover of Time Magazine? Everett Dirksen. And Humphrey was delighted with that because the bill had passed. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think we, we need to remember that there were people, just as at the time of the founding, there were people who, gathered together of both races, both parties, against all the odds to do the right thing for the right reason. And, and that has to make us feel at least a little bit hopeful that it won't be the last time that ever happened in American life. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, um, let's open this up to questions, please. And I'll just try to call around at the audience. Let me start over here. Is the story about uh, California Senator Claire Engel true that he was dying of brain cancer, was carried into the Senate, and then pointed to his eye to signify that he was voting high on a crucial vote? And was his vote crucial? His vote was crucial in the sense that every vote counted for closing off debate and for final passage. Uh, the vote for cloture, the cutting off debate, was 71, and they needed 67. He was wheeled onto the floor by his wife. He was dying of a brain tumor. The clerk called the roll, and they said, Ms. Engel, California, and he couldn't speak, so he put his hand, not once, but three times with great effort, raised his hand to his eye, and the clerk in a whisper said, I guess that means I, and they recorded it as yes. And uh, it, it's really a remarkable story. And uh, weeks later, he was dead. Over here, please. 
People often uh, say that without the assassination of JFK, without the change to LBJ, who is much more of a master legislator than JFK, this wouldn't have happened, or it wouldn't have happened at that time. But you also, at the beginning of your talk, talked about the crowded docket of events in 63, how many things were happening in terms of the sit-ins, in terms of the slayings, in terms of the whole turmoil which some would say grew into the anti-war movement, perhaps, of the 68-69 period. So was it events that were happening that would have carried the day, that would have propelled JFK to, as he was starting to be more involved in civil rights, to be a better legislator? And he would have ended up where we ended up? Or was history really quite different because of the assassination? It's just such an imponderable question, and I think it's an excellent question, and his historians do disagree. I think Robert Kerr is on the record as saying he's not sure if Kennedy had, had lived, we'd have the bill to this day. But I think that one thing that is not very well remembered is in the fall of 63, when the bill was all hung up in the Judiciary Committee of the House, and the liberals and the most ardent civil rights supporters were letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, and they were loading it up with things like applying it to state and local elections and so forth. Uh, applying, applying the public dis uh, accommodation section to barbershops and law firms that would have probably doomed the bill in the House and certainly in the Senate. Kennedy got them to back off in, in a very adroit personal lobbying campaign in which sort of one by one he called them to the White House. And he's not usually thought of as possessing those skills, as, as you note. But I think he had shown himself to be a pretty smooth operator at that point, and he was so invested in it and yes, he may have been a reluctant convert, but he's also famously competitive and he liked to win. And I think events would have continued to be his ally. And I think the, the big change that he had in the spring of 63 was he realized that these events could in fact be his friend, not his enemy, and that these events would at last focus attention. And the other thing, both he and his brother, the Attorney General, came to believe that the only way to stop the demonstrations was to stop the discrimination, and the only way to do that was with a law. And of course, we saw that in the wake of this bill, and in the wake of the Voting Rights Act, the Watts riots broke out days after the Voting Rights Act was passed. So the demonstrations continued as the 60s went on and got worse. But there were a number of people who voted for this bill for totally non-altruistic reasons, but for pragmatic reasons, because they thought it would stop the, the turmoil in the streets. And I think that's something that we also should remember. Hmm. Please. due to the irreversible tide of history. But um, not to make it a chicken and egg qu question, but how much has the passage of the act changed or influenced people's perception of race? And now 50 years later in retrospect, how much of it has actually inconsequently masked the lingering issue of race in the political landscape today and might have led to further polarization or division in the politics of today? Well, that's a very good question, a complex one. I guess starting with the second part, I think it, it, the, the bill has masked some aspects of the continuing division because it focused on ending legal segregation while leaving economic disparities and de facto segregation largely in place. Those are the problems we're still grappling with today. When President Kennedy proposed the bill in June of 63, he had a sobering set of statistics about the different mm -hmm. prospects of a black and white baby born in the same place on the same day. And on questions like access to education, life expectancy, things are much, much better for African Americans today. But on questions of lifetime earning power and median income, it's almost exactly the same. And so that business really is unfinished. And of course, the other thing is, in terms of the, the overt legacy, I mean, the, the obvious one is that President Obama, who held Everett Dirksen's Senate seat, by the way, from Illinois, is in the White House. And there was a very emotional meeting that Robert Kennedy had in the spring of 1963 with a group of black intellectuals in New York, led by James Baldwin and Lorraine Hansberry, the playwright who's raising in the sun is on Broadway right now with Denzel Washington. And he went there wanting to brag about how much he thought the Kennedy administration had done, hiring more black lawyers in the Justice Department, bringing suits around the country. And they weren't having any of it because they wanted him to know how much work still remained unfinished and just how grindingly grim conditions were for African Americans in the country. And they lashed out at him two, three hours. He was totally taken aback. And uh, at one point in the evening, he said to them, look, my ancestors came here from Ireland only 100 years ago, and now my brother is in the White House. 
there's no reason why you couldn't have a, he said, Negro president in 40 years. Well, he was wrong, but only by five years. So, I mean, in some ways it is a remarkable, a remarkable change. But, but it, I think it has had the effect of, in some ways, discrimination is less overt now. The rhetoric is somewhat less obnoxious than whether it's okay to use cattle prods. But one of the things I said to the professor before we began is that there's really no vicious email that would cross President Obama's desk that would have surprised President Kennedy and vice versa except President Kennedy would have a little postcard, but uh, the, the, one of the most horrifying things in this research was to see what people were willing to sit down and in their perfect penmanship write to the President of the United States, just horrible things. And so we shouldn't kid ourselves that we live in the end of days when it comes to manners. Please in the back. Um, given your research with presidents generally, um, how would you sort of contextualize um, how President Obama is dealing with or not dealing with the issue of race today, um, especially in the context of the way that the Supreme Court has dealt with um, sort of pulling back some of the civil rights protections in the past couple of years. Um, how, how will history judge him for that and how do you sort of see what's going on? Well, I think it's uh, somewhat of a paradox. I think it's very hard for President Obama as, as he implicitly acknowledges, to talk about some of these issues. Uh, he talked about it famously in the 2008 campaign, of course. But it seems that whenever he wades into questions of race, uh, he gets in trouble uh, for saying, to me, totally obvious things. Like if he had a son, he would look like Trayvon. Or when he got involved in the question of Professor Gates at Harvard and said the Cambridge police had acted foolishly or stupidly, whatever he said. People rear up and say, oh my gosh, how can he say this? Uh, and I think he thinks he's just stating what is an absolute you know, reality and fact for him. Uh, obviously, Attorney General Holder and the Justice Department have had to weigh in on these cases around the country where there are these voter suppression efforts or voter ID laws and so forth in the wake of the Supreme Court's decisions on the Voting Rights Act. I think um, so many uh, white Americans thought that the president's, President Obama's election was itself proof that we're in a post-racial society and we don't need to talk about this anymore. I think uh, uh, most African Americans think the exact reverse is true. And um, I think it is painful to, I mean, the president was so eloquent last week down at the LBJ Library. He spoke very clearly about the legacy that we have from these days and the burden we still have to work on the problem. Um, but it's very hard for him, I think, sometimes to wade into these issues uh, precisely because so many people are willing to assume bad faith and to jump all over him. And because th he faces, a, I don't know how you identify the size of it, but he faces a sizable chunk of the country that simply cannot make peace with the fact that he is there in the White House and it colors uh, every aspect of their dealing with him. And a lot of these issues about whether he's a Muslim or from Kenya or whatever else he may be, that's all a proxy for, for the question uh, of race. And I think, um, and I, and I think you know, it's, it's painful for him, and I'm sure it's painful for him. I, I'd be very, very interested to see, for example, you know, what he may say in his memoirs about this question, because I'm sure it's been something that's been very much on his mind. Please. Yes, in your NPR interviews, you talked about the delays that were being advised for uh, Lyndon Johnson to uh, avoid signing the bill immediately. So in the midst of all this euphoria of which you just spoke, uh, I wonder if you could elaborate just a little more on what's the backstory on that? Why, why were his counselors advising him to delay signing the bill after they'd all worked so terribly hard to, to get it passed? Well, the bill came to final passage in the House. It had to go back to the House after the Senate because there had been some changes. Senator Dirksen made the changes on July 2nd, 1964. And there, a rumor had spread that the president intended to sign it on July 4th. And on the morning of July 2nd, he gets a call from Claire Booth Luce, the actress and former congresswoman from Connecticut, Republican. Her husband was Henry Luce, the founder of Time Life. And she said, darling, I just heard this appalling rumor that you intend to sign this bill on the 4th of July. That just seems so mysterious. He said, no, 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 I'm gonna sign it as soon as I get it. It'll probably be today. Then Bobby Kennedy calls and says, Mr. President, I don't know if it's too late to hold off, but..." You might want to wait until Monday because if we go into this long weekend with Negroes running all over every hotel in the South and firecrackers going off and testing this law and 
it might, we might have some terrible times. And Johnson thinks this is a horrible idea, but he distrusts Bobby so thoroughly that he calls about five or six other people being careful to say, the Attorney General thinks we ought to delay. And to a person, they all say, oh no, Mr. President, you've got to sign it right away tonight. And then the debate is what time the networks will let him go on TV. He wants seven o'clock. And his press secretary comes back and says, they want to give you at 645 because they say that'll be a bigger audience. Well, Johnson had grown rich owning a television station in Austin, and he knew what the station, the networks wanted. He said, they just don't want to give up that night prime time. And so the speech was at 645. But, um, but indeed, he, uh, he faced a lot of conflicting pressure, pressures about what to do. And he, one of the reasons he wanted to sign it the minute he got it was the Republicans were getting out of town for their convention. And he wanted to make sure that the pictures and the, the, the film and the newsreels had the Republicans there beside him. And the very first pen he gave from the signing was, in fact, to Everett Dirksen. And he didn't want them to feel cheated. Hmm. Clarence? Oh, sorry, Clarence, over here. Um, thank you both for sharing your time this evening with us. I have a quick question about how throughout the um, evening you spoke about how like the shadow of Lincoln really kind of informed the perspectives of some of the Republican congressmen in terms of the decision that they made during their votes. I was really interested in wondering um, to what extent did they all also maybe borrow from the political strategies of Lincoln in the passage of the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments as well as other civil rights legislation be between the years of 1865 and 1877? Well, you know, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think um, in some ways, uh, as we know, Lincoln's views on this all evolved as the war went on itself, and he famously said, if I could uh, keep the South by, I'm going to get it wrong, but you know, I, if, by freeing the slaves or not freeing them, I'd do whatever I would to keep the Union together. Uh, and they felt a little bit like that, I think. Uh, certainly, one of the debates very early on in the bill was whether the public accommodation section, the, the de desegregation provisions, should be based in the 14th Amendment, because the Republicans saw that as their baby. Uh, and they thought that would be a great thing to ground it in constitutionally. The problem was in the 1880s, the Supreme Court had overturned some desegregation laws passed in Reconstruction, and they had, the, that, that Supreme Court decision had, to that day, never been overturned. So the administration decided to base it partly on the 14th Amendment and partly on the Commerce Clause. And again, it's very much like the debate that we saw over the health care bill, whether to base it in the taxing power or the Commerce Clause or whatever. And, um, so I don't know enough about the detailed level of their internal discussions about whether they talked about the, the 13th Amendment. But certainly, um, some people have told me that they found reading my book very much like watching Lincoln and seeing how the, the thing actually unfolded in terms of, you know, on the one hand, you had the firebrands pushing from the edges, and the other, you had the Wheeler dealers, uh, you know, who were willing to cut a, cut a deal in, in the... In the I might add, just in relation to that, that the 1875 Civil Rights Act actually was the first instance in which public accommodations were put out as a category that needed to be transformed through legislation. And in fact, if anything, the Act of 1875 was stronger in that there was both a fine and an imprisonment if you were actually going to deny service to someone of a different race at many of the same kinds of public amenities that were cataloged within Title II of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. And of course, as, as Todd was saying, that was overturned by an 1883 decision in the Supreme Court that was really in many ways the precursor to the Plessy decision. So whether they went back to the 14th Amendment, I mean, and I think that they, they did make very fine distinctions about what would stand up to a state's rights objective. I think they certainly had in mind that clause that had been put in in 1875 in the Civil Rights Act. And Bill McCulloch went back even further to the English common law by noting to the Southerners that Jim Crow was a complete aberration in the annals of our, of our law and that the English common law had always maintained that as long as someone could pay and was, you know, comely, mm -hmm. right. an innkeeper had a, a duty to serve him. And, and that, that in the long history of these kinds of things, our, our brief experiment with apartheid was the exception and not the rule, uh, however much the Southerners wanted to say it was enshrined in their traditions and culture, but that it, there was a far older tradition in our shared society that really had the other, uh, other, other approach. We have time maybe for one more question, perhaps over here. Uh, in uh, the Weber decision, uh, Justice Rehnquist wrote that the Civil Rights Act was passed because of ag agreement and even consensus on a colorblind norm. Since then, others uh, like Cass Sunstein 
argue that uh, we should really look at it as an anti-subordination principle that favors using race preferences to address disparities. Uh, I wonder what, well first, what your study of passage of the act indicates about what uh, norm uh, did bring uh, consensus to get the bill through the House and Senate, but then secondly, as a speculation, that if political pressure to deal with disparities had followed a colorblind principle, that could have led to more pressure, more political pressure, to address disparities through uh, well, colorblind measures, policies like early child care or education reform instead of uh, uh, race preferences that generated a lot of backlash. Uh, well, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm certainly not a constitutional lawyer, but taking the second question, I think one of the things that this bill clearly did do was leave, a, leave aside for another day, another generation, all questions of economic justice and all questions that we're still grappling with now. Johnson was eager to get this bill passed in part because he believed things like you know, early childhood education, the Great Society, Medicare, Medicaid would in fact have a beneficial effect that would be colorblind but would have uh, a naturally disproportionate effect on the people who needed it the most. As to the first part of your question, the legislative record of the debates is quite clear that over and over again, uh, Humphrey and the, the floor managers assure people that nothing in the employment discrimination section should be construed. It says nothing should be construed to in include you know, quotas or addressing racial imbalance or all these things that became so divisive as the 60s and then the 70s wore on. And it's clear to me that any number of senators who voted for this bill would never have done so if they thought it would lead to what we now know as uh, affirmative action or um, you know, those kinds of things. It, and uh, President Kennedy in his speech said the Constitution must be colorblind. This, this, the goal of this bill was to remove legal justifications for segregation in the theory that some great marketplace or, you know, clockmaker benevolent God w would sort it all out. And of course we saw that that was not enough and it didn't do it. But, but I think the legislative record is clear that this was not intended to envision the subsequent jurisprudence that came about, about uh, uh, race conscious remedies, uh, th this was really the last gasp of trying to say w we should have colorblind remedies and it, it obviously didn't, didn't work. Well, we are <clears throat> over at quarter to eight and I know that many of you are eager to have your books signed by Todd Purdom. So please join me in thanking Todd for a wonderful Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.